o la carabina Bring to the to one of the chairs, uh, Jose Antonio Pepe Vargas. Please, Jose Antonio. Hola, Chicago. <laughs> and I want to also invite. Our dear Sharon Mujica, please, Sharon, come. And the answer is why not? Because, <laughs> yeah, people have asked me, to, and then um, why not having a film festival where we can use the power of cinema, which it really has no limit <clears throat> and it's so comprehensive to uh, show people who we are as, as people. And knowing what I know about who we are, because I was born in Colombia, grew up in Argentina, live in Chile, live in Mexico, and then uh, Los Angeles, Chicago, so I've been around. <laughs> I have a PhD of wandering around. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the University of the Streets has taught me a lot. And so knowing all of that, things that I know about who we are as people, and, and also learning what discrimination is, and it's an ugly thing, and, and it's evil, and it's bad, and how can we fight back? We, we can fight back with who we are and appealing to the artists, the creative minds of our communities, and knowing that we are a family of many nations, many races, many languages. And so we celebrated the great diversity that exists among ourselves. Uh, rather than be better than, uh, we are claiming that it's good to be different than. And so putting all together all of this great diversity that we have is what we've had found the, the wealth of our culture. And that's what we wanted to share. And there's no better way that I haven't found any other than doing that through film. And five to work um, at the university. I thought, gosh, these incredible courses in political science and history and music, etc. But th where's the culture? I, I couldn't find it. And at that time, there were very few Latinos living here. It was before the 80s when there was a large influx of people coming to live in Chapel Hill. We did have graduate students and we had some faculty, but not many. And so it just occurred to me that one way that I could be um, doing something that I knew about and that I felt I could be successful with and that it was important because of the cultures of Latin America and the lack of information. I don't know if you all know that at that time, you, were, you couldn't show Latin American film in our theaters. It was prohibited. And because of the, the kind of filming that they wanted, which was American film once in a while, a, a, a European film, but a Latin American film had to be very, very special to be shown in our theaters. So there was actually no opportunity to see film. So I decided and was told, okay, go ahead, see what you can do to start this small festival, which I never had any idea would still be continuing all these years. And back then, one thing that I wanted to mention, I don't know about Pepe, was, you know, all we had was 35 millimeter and 16. And there was only one theater at Chapel Hill that showed 35 millimeter. And they said, oh no, you can't show your films here. So that was, that made things very different. So we had to work a lot with distributors at that time. And New Yorker Films was one of the places to get, to get some of the better ones coming out, the best ones actually, because they would pick them up and distribute them. And then with time, there were more um, companies that distributed documentaries, so we were able to, to you know, go in with documentaries. And we always had discussions. We had the films presented, then we had discussions afterwards, which I think, as you were mentioning, is one of the most valuable things because we are here as a community to see a film, and afterwards we have many different impressions. And so I think that part of, of especially on a university campus, was, was very important, and we began to have a 
cadre of people, some of them I've seen tonight, who have always come to the film festival all these years. I mean, there was a lot of political activism. And then films, they reflect society changes. In Argentina, for instance, there were Laura de los Hornos. It's a very famous film because it basically started dealing with a situation with a dictatorship and what was coming, the dirty war. And there's a lot of films that have been, been made because of that, La Noche de los Lapices. Yeah. And then it comes the dictatorship in uh, Chile. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned this, this documentary uh, filmmaker that you are going to see the film. He was starting his career there, making films about the repression. And so there was a dictatorship in Brazil as well, in Bolivia, and then the Cuban Revolution. So there was a lot of political activism, and all of this was the anti-imperialistic movement. And that, that, that gave, uh, I guess, the, the, the need to start telling these stories. And filmmakers and also writers and poets and uh, there was a lot of all the intellectuals really um, making their voice be heard and, 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 and joining the struggle of people to change and, and that, uh, that happened and in Mexico, you probably hear Tlatelolco, uh, that was this huge killing of people that still we don't know how many were killed, so an estimated 3,000, and so uh, later on films were made about that, that, his, that they had to be buried because uh, filmmakers could not afford to really um, fight back the, uh, the, the system, they were too powerful. Ultimately, those, those films came to light and, uh, and they would start learning about, and that is what, what cinema does, uncovering and, and really being in the, bringing the truth and, and then we learn. And then I felt from my part, uh, the obligation to share these stories, start sharing there. And that is what gave birth to the Latino Film Festival. And that answered the question, why not? Because it's needed. We need to make sure that what we know and what people have wanted to say is, is, is being shared and other people learn about. The other thing was the wars in Central America. That was one of the big things in the 80s. That drew people into Latin American studies in general. We had a lot of people taking courses. And it also influenced the film festival with documentaries from those countries showing what was really going on because we didn't have a very good idea actually of what was, what in our name was being done in Central America. So I just add that. I mean, it's, uh, it's an, an incredible journey. So many things has happened. But there are two really critical moments in the life of the Latino Film Festival. Back in 87, there was a film, and you mentioned Frida Kahlo. Frida Kahlo became sort of an international icon. And still, she is. Recently, I went to Russia, and I went to a bookstore in St. Petersburg. And I was amused by seeing a stand of books and memorabilia <laughs> by Frida Kahlo. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are in 2019, I mean, yeah, 2019. But in the mid-80s, she became something of uh, an international figure. And in Chicago, there was a film that is happening actually now, it's 55 years old, the International Film Festival. And they have refused to bring to Chicago a film about Frida Kahlo. Um, and then I learned that and people, we were beginning because that we began 85 and we began projected the films in a concrete world. And the following year we had 2,500 people and now we got 25,000. Uh, things have changed and evolved. But that film that was rejected by the International Film Festival, so it came to my attention. So that became a quest, how can I bring this film? And, and, and we start putting the things together because a lot of loose pieces. So you put them together, we were able to get uh, four tickets from uh, an airline that doesn't exist anymore, but we do. 
They're like nothing. Um, they, are, they, they are gone. Well, we got the four ticket. We brought the actor who played Trotsky in the film, and the actress very famous, Ophelia Medina, who played Frida, and the uh, Trotsky's wife played the, uh, the, the role of, of his wife in the film, and so we brought these four people to the film festival. And a film that the International Film Festival had refused to show, we scheduled two performances, two showings, one 6.30, which did not begin at 6.30. <laughs> it began at the Latino time, <laughs> which is uh, about uh, 7.30. 8 o'clock. Uh, 7.30. <laughs> um, and then we had sold a second one that was to begin at 8.30, which began at 9.30. But I was absolutely crazy having these two shows sold way out in advance in a theater of 500 seats. And then we had to show the film third time at one in the morning out of the schedule because there were, we, we got 500 people in the theater and a thousand outside who wanted to see a Mexican film. And so we improvised the third show in at one in the morning and pack the theater. So uh, what did I get out of that? The least a clear message that the Latino thing has to be done by somebody who cares about that, who is committed to make sure that things run the way they need to be done. I'm sure you don't know this. The first film that was ever made on Frida Kahlo, which was a documentary made by a friend of mine, Marcelo Fernandez Violante, came back to Chapel Hill, nobody seemed to know who Frida Kahlo was. They might have known Diego Rivera, but they didn't know Frida Kahlo. And then Paul Le Duc in Mexico made the first film, feature film of Frida, which is the one you're talking about. And so I was very fortunate because I had a really good friend who was the head of the Mexican Institute of Film. Um, his name was Ignacio Duran. And so I was dying to get, Phil, uh, to get Frida. And of course it was very expensive and it hadn't been released. It, when, when we had it, it had not been released in the theater. So I said, okay, Nacho, what can you do for me? He said, okay, I'm taking it to New York for its estreno for the first time it's gonna be shown. And if you want me to, I'll come to Chapel Hill. So he brought the Frida to Chapel Hill before it was shown in New York. And what happened in the middle of it, it was a 35 millimeter film and there was all this stuff about getting it and you know, getting, it, getting him from the airlines, blah, blah, blah. It, it got burned, the film burned. And I mean, it was one of those moments when you just don't know what you're gonna do and you just sit there and think, okay, we gotta deal with this later. Well, fortunately, there was somebody on the campus who could fix it the next day and you could not tell. But that was quite a night and it was a great success as was yours. We had standing room only, we had a reception, I think before or after, I don't remember. But I was able to do that because of somebody I knew, and, and that was true with me for a lot of films, because otherwise we didn't have any money. We had very little money, and we didn't charge, and so we had to um, you know, do what we could do, and people were very generous. That was another thing about Latin Americans, is they're very generous with their work, and they want it shown, and, and so they'll go that extra step to help you, and they won't ask you, where's my $500 afterwards? So we showed that, that was one of the more exciting movies. And then I'll just tell you another one because it's absolutely unforgettable. It was in the first series, I think the one that you showed, and it was City and the Dogs from Peru, a very, very important film. And we were getting it from a film festival in Miami and it was being sent by bus. And we were gonna show it at the Carolina Theater in Chapel Hill, which was on Franklin Street, if most of you must know Chapel Hill, at 11 o'clock at night. And the reason we were doing that was because it was a 35 millimeter film and we didn't have any other place to show it. And I was a lot younger back then and I thought it just sounded like a great idea and we were gonna have a party beforehand <laughs> and so forth and so on. And so they call me up from the Chapel Hill bus station and they say, your film is here. So I said, okay, great. Send one of my student workers with uh, to go down and pick it up. By the time she got there, it was gone. It was stolen. <laughs> And yeah, I mean, the film was literally stolen out of the Chapel Hill bus station. Who knows why? Nobody could ever figure out why anybody wanted it. But the blame got given to Miami because they didn't insure it. <laughs> so we didn't have the film to show that night, uh, which kind of messed up everything. But we did have a great party. So that was just another, another anecdote. <laughs>